So, for the first week, we're just basically going to talk about what is chemistry. And if you wanted to give me a definition of what chemistry is, what would you give me? Somebody just take a wild guess. Yes. Study of matter. Study of matter. And study of what else, do you think? Energy. <laughs> Chemistry is the study of matter and energy. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what is matter and energy. We're not going to study it really today. That's the rest of the semester. But today we're going to talk about what is matter, what is energy, and what is science. So if chemistry is the study of matter and energy, we need to break down what these are. So the first half of the lecture is just going to continue to build this out and out and out, getting more and more specific. So really, matter is something that takes up space and has mass. Energy is not matter. So those are basically the two different things that exist in our universe. There is matter and there is energy. They are separate from each other. Energy does not occupy space. The light coming out of here is not taking up any space. Heat in the room is not taking up any space. If it is not taking up space, and it also has no mass, it is not matter. So look at this picture. What do you see in that picture that is made of matter? A car? Go ahead, you're going to say them. A road? People? Buildings? Bridges? Stop Pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. Is there something in that picture you don't see that is made of matter? Air. Air. Air is made of matter. It's gas. It's just clear, it's invisible to our eyes. But it is made of matter. What type of energy? We're, we're forgetting just types at this point. What do you see in this picture that is energy? Light. The light. There's all kinds of lights here. There's sunlight, there's stop lights, tail lights, headlights. What else? Say it again. Heat. There's heat. You can't see it, but you know there's heat here, right? What else? Sound. There's sound. There's certainly sound. Sound is, is compression waves. That's energy. Radios. Radios. Is there a radio wave and all kinds of things like that? X-rays coming from outer space? What about people moving? People moving. What about people moving? Kinetic, Kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is the, the energy of movement. So anything that's moving has kinetic energy. Anybody take physics and know kind of what, what's, the, what's the type of energy that goes with kinetic energy? Potential energy. We'll talk about potential energy in a minute. But things like the flag here that are suspended up off the ground have potential energy. <coughs> now looking in here. What things in this room are related to chemistry? Everything. Periodic table is obvious, right? You said everything. Why everything? Because everything is made up of molecules. Everything is matter. Plus, plus or energy, right? Yeah. I said everything in the universe is made up of matter or energy. And hopefully we are in this universe. And so, if we're in this universe, everything in this room is made up of matter or energy, and chemistry is the study of matter and energy. So everything in this room, in a trick question sense, is related to chemistry. Her answer is the more straightforward scientific answer, the periodic table, right? The chemistry lecture slides, those are related to chemistry. But in an English major sense, everything is related to chemistry. If you wanted to categorize the things in this room, you can make up your own categories. They don't have to be scientific. How would you categorize? Density. You can go by density. So what's 
is like high density, low density. What's, some, what's something in here that you think would have a high density? Metal. Metal. What's something in here that you think would have a low density? Say it again. Pencil. A pencil. Something, probably the lowest density thing in here is the thing you can't see. Air. Air. We'll talk more about density later. What other categories can you make up? State. State, like Florida versus Georgia? Solid liquid gas. Solid liquid gas. You got three states. Yes, there are actually some others, but for us, it's solid liquid gas. There's also plasma. We're not going to talk about plasma. And then there's also one they just discovered about a year ago, Jan Teller gases. Yes, that is my name. No, I did not discover it, unfortunately. <laughs> what else? How, how, how else can you categorize this? Color. What's different between a floor and a stable? Tile and wood. Tile and wood. What's the difference between my, my jacket and the table? If you were to punch one of them, which one would you want to punch? Why? Soft. Soft. Soft versus hard. I mean, you can make up all kinds of categories, right? We're going to have specific ones that we need to learn. Okay? <coughs> we're going to first start with our matter. So we had the matter and energy. The matter is the one that we're really going to focus on this semester. And so we're really going to drill down in the types of matter. Matter comes in two subtypes. There are pure substances and there are mixtures. What do you think of an example of a pure substance? Gold. Gold? Yeah, it's gold, right? It's just gold. It's not anything else. What's an example of a mixture? Water. Yeah, water. Salt water. Salt water. Kool-Aid. <laughs> Pebbles. Pebbles, yeah. So we have pure substances where everything there is exactly the same. And then we have mixtures where it's multiple substances mixed together. So Kool-Aid has water, sugar, food coloring, all kinds of things you probably don't want to know, right? Salt water has water and salt. The gold is just gold. Pure substances we can break apart further. There are elements and there are compounds. A pure substance has the same composition throughout. So from the top to the bottom, from the left to the right, it's exactly the same. And if I have one sample over here and another sample over here, they are both identical. That is a pure substance. We need to then put them into elements and compounds. Figuring out whether a pure substance is an element or a compound is really, really easy. If it's an element, it's here. If it's up here, it's an element. If it's not up here, it must be a compound. So is gold an element or a compound? Oh, this just doesn't have names, but gold is AU. So gold is up there. Gold is an element. What about water? Compound. The compound. Do you, do, do you know what the formula for water is? H2O. H2O. We haven't covered it yet, but do you know what H2O means? What does that tell us? Two hydrogens, one oxygen. So it is made up of multiple elements. There is not water up here. Water is not up here, and so water is not an element. If it's not an element, it's automatically a compound, assuming it's a pure substance. What an element is, is essentially a building block. When you were little, or maybe even now, nothing wrong with this, you may have played with Legos, okay? You have all the different Legos that you can build with. Different shapes, different sizes, different colors. And you can't 
break them. I've tried. You can't break a Lego, right? You, you can break you if you step on oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Legos will break you, but you can't break a Lego. They're your basic building blocks. You can't break them down any further. We'll talk about subatomic particles, but that is breaking down, breaking down elements into parts is beyond this class. For us, an element is the smallest building block you can break it down into. Okay? Once you get past that, all of a sudden it is not that element anymore. So if you have a chunk of gold, you can keep breaking it in half over and over and over and over again and still multiple chunks of gold. But once you get down to one atom, we'll talk about what atoms are, you can't go any further. The element is the simplest building block you have. If gold is pure, and you have 14 karat gold, and 10 karat gold, and 24 karat gold. Because the gold that they're selling, 24 karat gold, is pure gold. What they're selling is 10 karat and 14 karat gold is not pure gold. Okay. It's being sold as gold, but it's not <laughs> gold. Every element known to man is up here. The black ones are the ones that occur naturally on Earth. The white ones are ones that people have made in labs. They normally they just exist for like a microsecond and then they're gone. But if you get it to exist for a microsecond and you can prove it, you get to put an element on the periodic table. Okay? There is no theoretical end to the periodic table. Next week we'll talk about it might be two weeks, I think it's two weeks from now. We'll talk about what makes the different elements different from each other and what makes up an atom. But theoretically, you can make an endless number of elements going on and on and on. So they are shown in the periodic table. If you haven't used a periodic table before, you're probably looking at that saying, it's a bunch of elements in blocks, in lines, rows, and columns, seemingly in random places. There is a ton of information on this periodic table. Not only in each box, but also which row things are which row things are in, which column things are in, where the spaces are. There's a lot of stuff in there. And over the course of the semester you'll learn to get more and more out of that. We can break elements down in the different sections. Elements come in metals and non-metals. Just like we looked up here and said if it's up here, it's an element, and if it's not up there by default it's a compound, we have the same thing here. We have metals, and if it's not a metal, it's a non-metal. So we haven't talked about what makes something a metal or a non-metal. But I want you to look at these pictures. Tell me whether they are a metal or a non-metal, just based on what you already know. Looking at that, metal or non-metal? Non-metal. Non-metal. What about that one? Metal. Metal? metal. metal. A, there's a kind of a reddish brown liquid in that box. Non-metal. Non-metal? Metal. Metal? 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 Metal. 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 Non-metal, but kind of not really sure. That one? Carbon's non-metal? Well, th that's what we said. We'll come back to it. Okay. But the consensus was non-metal, but I'm not really sure. Okay. What about aluminum? Metal, non-metal? Aluminum's metal. Okay. Metal, sulfur? Non-metal? Metal. How did you know? Let's start looking at it. I didn't give you a definition. Yeah. Shiny? Shiny. You laugh, but that is actually part of the official definition on the next slide. Metals are shiny. So that would make carbon a metal. This carbon, we'll talk about the actual definition based on the periodic table in a minute. Carbon is a non-metal. <laughs> this is one of the ones that's kind of tricky. Can you look at, there's light coming off of it, right? You, you see it right in here? Uh -huh. But this table kind of reflects light also, and you know that's not metal. You kind of have to, kind of in your mind, say, is it shiny or is it just reflecting light? I can't give you a good definition between the difference between the two. I can't 
put that into words. But I think you can probably, in your mind, see the difference between that sparkly reflectiveness and that shininess, or that shininess. Okay. On a quiz or an exam, you're never going to be given a picture and say, is this a, me a metal or a not metal? Okay. You'll do it in a lab, but there's no, very low stakes. So you said the metals are shiny. Metals, shiny. Metals also conduct electricity. You can't look at that both pictures and figure out if something conducts electricity. But in a lab, you can test it. So the two things you need to have in order to be a metal is you need to be shiny, and yes, shiny is a scientific term, and you have to be able to conduct electricity. Okay? If you can't do both of them, if you can't do both of them, you are a non metal. Non metals are dull or do not conduct electricity. We'll, we'll see later on that there are a few elements that are shiny but don't conduct electricity. And those are not metals. To be a metal, you have to do both. So looking at that, magnesium. Metal, none metal. Metal. Yeah, metal. There are some spots, it looks kind of shiny, it looks metallic. I mean, that, that's a word we use, right? This looks metallic. What about selenium? It looks less metal, it looks yeah. like a rock, right? Yeah. It looks like a rock you would find on the side of the room. It is not shiny. If you tested it, it does not conduct electricity. Selenium is a non metal. Okay. So, phosphorus. These, these, these are the same elements we did on the pictures. Now we're going to look at them up here on the periodic table. So, phosphorus is here. Do we face phosphorus with metal or non metal? Non metal. Non metal. So, that's a non metal. We've got gold. Metal. That's a metal. Carbon is non. a non metal. <laughs> Copper is a metal. Bromine, non metal. Aluminum, metal. Sulfur, non metal. Nickel, metal. Lead, metal. And tin, metal. Do you see any sort of pattern? Yeah. Things on the right are non-metals. Things on the left are metals. And it's not, unfortunately, a clean line at 15. It starts about there. But there's actually a stair step. It goes through here. Okay. Some periodic table will have it drawn on there for you, kind of bold. It just goes like this, zigzagging through here. Things to the left of that line are metals. Things to the right of that line are non-metals. And so carbon, which is in phase 14, is a non-metal. But because the line is diagonal, lead down at the bottom, also in 14, is a metal. Okay? So remember that line. If it's to the left of the line, it's a metal. If it's the right of the line, it is a non-metal. Metals and non-metals are going to behave very differently for us. So for the rest of the semester, you're going to have to be able to predict how is it going to react. Okay? We're not going to do that today. But later on, you're going to have to be able to predict how is it going to react. And you're going to predict that based on is it to the left or the right of the line. The elements are made up of atoms. Okay? The atom is the smallest Lego you can have. It's the little one bumper. Okay? That is the atom. You can have multiple atoms put together in a chunk. You can break it down further and further and further and further until you get to one atom. If you break that atom apart, it is no longer gold. It has different properties but the properties of one atom of gold 
will be exactly the same as a giant bar of gold. The color, the boiling point, the melting temperature, everything like that will be the same. Let's take a break now. We'll start back up at 7.30 on that clock. This clock doesn't work. So you got about 10 minutes.
several classes. We're all in this together. <laughs> I actually work nights, but I took off so that I could take this class. So instead of having like weekends off, I now work every weekend and have Tuesdays, Thursdays off. Changed, I changed labs back in April. And to be honest, since then, most of the computers have been <laughs> um, So I worked in a lab in grad, grad school. When I was there, I was working on breast cancer. So I was studying how the number of chromosomes in cancer cells change over time, and then also developing new chemotherapeutic drugs using computer modeling and then actually testing them and then making them. Um, and then once you graduate grad school, you're going to be a professor, you have to do what's called a postdoc. It's essentially purgatory between grad school and being a professor. So you have a PhD, and you're doing PhD level work, but you're not paying you like you have a PhD. And so when I was doing that, I was looking at the metabolism or the breakdown of a cancer drug in the body, and then more specifically, I had found that the, the protein or enzyme that breaks it down normally in your liver breaks it, is sometimes expressed in tumors. And so the tumors essentially eat the drug before the drug is killed. So I was studying that. In my new lab, I am looking at mutations in leukemia and how that causes uh, leukemia advancement. They're smart tumors. Unfortunately, yes. Well, it's, it's, one thing you learn very quickly is a tumor is essentially evolution gone bad. It's, it's one cell in your body that evolves and then it becomes survival of the fittest type of thing where your, your body normally kills tumor cells that go rogue, basically. And the ones that can evade it continue to grow. And then if you give a, a chemotherapy drug, you kill the cells that are sensitive, but the ones that have evolved to be resistant then you continue to grow. And so the tumor shrinks and grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks and grows. you do that, you need to take out good tissue around it, but it's your brain. And so you 
don't want to take up more than you have to. So if you're taking out a kidney or something, you take up the whole kidney and say, I'm done with it. Everybody back? Oops. Okay. So we're talking about elements. Up there, we have all of our elements, and every element has a symbol. An element symbol is one or two letters. The ones down here that have three don't have official names yet. That's why they, they don't have just a two letter symbol. And so in most cases, the symbol has something to do with the name. Carbon is C, calcium is CA. Because carbon was already C, calcium can't be C, so let's call it CA. Unfortunately, there are some weird ones. Iron is FE, right there. Where the heck do you get FE for iron? From its original name. From its original name, yes. As much as Americans like to think that Americans were the original people on Earth and that we discovered everything that humanity knows, yep. we did not, okay? Mm -hmm. A lot of elements were originally named in the Latin. Iron is ferric or ferrous in Latin. So that's where the F-E comes from. Luckily, a lot of the elements, when you go from Latin to English, they stay similar enough that the symbols sort of make sense. But there are a few of them that don't. Copper is cuprum, so it's C-U. Gold is silver, we're different. Potassium. Potassium is an element that we're going to use over and over and over again in this class. It's K. Okay. Then we've got sodium. Sodium, like sodium chloride. Sodium is Na. That's another weird one. Then we've got some other ones down here. This is a periodic table with some of them blacked out. For next week's quiz, in next week's quiz only, you are responsible for memorizing the elements that are not blacked out. There's a bigger picture of this on Canvas, just as that slide that you can see. You need to be able to go between the symbol and the name, and the name and the symbol. If I give you a symbol, you need to be able to tell me the name. If I give you a name, you need to be able to give me the symbol. Now, having memorized these is not in the learning objectives. When you take the final exam, when you take the, the exams in here, you will have a periodic table that has symbols and names. But I also said I'm not going to waste your time. So why am I making you memorize these? Any idea? They're the most common ones. They're the most common ones, yes. They're the ones that we're going to use over and over and over again all semester. If every time I say sodium chloride, you have to look up, oh, sodium is Na, and Cl is, oh, that's Cl, you're going to spend the entire semester looking at that dang periodic table, okay? If you memorize these now, the ones that we actually do use over and over and over again, they're going to be stuck in your brain. And so you're going to know them. So this quiz next week, you will not have a periodic table with a name on it. Okay, that one doesn't have names. For every quiz and every exam after that, you will have your own periodic table with symbols and names. Okay? So after next Tuesday, you do not have to have them memorized. But for the quiz, you do. But only the ones that are not blacked out. So, we said an atom is the smallest building block of an element. If we take a chunk of gold, we get smaller and, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to one gold atom. We can't build any further. We also have things called molecules. A molecule is multiple atoms stuck together. Okay? It can be two atoms of the same element, or it can be multiple atoms of different elements. Okay? We're going to continue to draw pictures like this. You have to make the assumption that if two atoms are the same color and the same size, the artist meant them to be <coughs> the same element. 
So because these two are the same, they look the same, they're the same element, because the middle one here looks different, this molecule is made up of two of the red ones and one of the black ones. Both of these are technically molecules. A molecule has more than one atom. It doesn't matter how many different elements there are. This is oxygen. There are two oxygens, but it's still a molecule. This is carbon dioxide. We have two oxygens plus a carbon. That is a molecule. Okay? We'll talk about how we do classify these different in a slide or two, but on this slide, these are both molecules. And not only are they stuck together, but they're not moving. If I have a chunk of gold, there's a bunch of gold atoms in there. And they are somewhat stuck to each other. But they are kind of moving, and they just happen to be next to each other. Okay? This gold atom is not permanently stuck to that, that one. That CO2 molecule will always have that oxygen, that carbon, with that oxygen in that order. Okay? They're not going to swivel around and move around. We call that a discrete arrangement. Okay. It is not oxygen, oxygen, carbon, or carbon, oxygen, oxygen. It is oxygen, carbon, oxygen. Okay. So we've got our elements broken into metals and non-metals. Now we have to come back up over to our compound. A compound is a pure substance. Remember, this is under the pure substances made up of two or more elements in definite proportions. And they're going to be bound together like that CO2 molecule. When I say definite proportions, I mean like CO2 says one carbon for every two oxygens. That's what that picture shows. There was one black one for every two red ones. Those are set proportions. If you have two carbons for every two oxygens, that's no longer the same molecule. It is no longer the same compound. Okay? This is iron pyrite. It's made up of iron and sulfur. It looks like that. If you take iron and sulfur, put them together in the same dish, that is not the same thing. This is a compound made up of iron and sulfur. The atoms are in a discrete arrangement, and they are bound to each other. That is just a bowl with some sulfur and some iron in it. Okay? It's very easy to separate sulfur and sulfur in the iron. Iron is magnetic. If you just put a magnet over top of your bowl, your iron is going to come out. They're not bound together in one thing. They just happen to be in the same place at the same time. Can you see the difference between that? And that. How do you get to when you heat it up to get it to be? To go from that to that? Mm -hmm. No, you, no you, the other way. You, you, you have to react them together, which is going to be a big complicated process. Okay. It's probably not just. Okay. A compound has different properties than the elements that went into it. And so the properties, the melting temperature, the color, the appearance, of the iron pyrite is completely different than either the sulfur or the iron. It is not a one in one equals two type of a deal. This can be one in one equals five. There's no good way to predict the properties of the compound are going to be when you put two elements together. The water is a compound. There are two elements in the compound. Hydrogen in oxygen. You can break molecules apart, but it takes a chemical reaction. If you have sulfur and iron in a bowl, you can just put them apart, right? But if you have water, you can't reach in, pluck out an oxygen, put it over there, pluck out a hydrogen, and put it over there. You need a chemical reaction to do that. When you separate water into hydrogen and oxygen, really all we need to do is pass a bunch of electricity through it. It's called electrolysis. You just take water, 
pass an electrical current through it, it will break it apart. When you break water apart, you get hydrogen and oxygen. Both of them are gases. And so if you put a wire with electricity running through in water, you get bubbles. The bubbles are hydrogen and oxygen. And there's a way that you can separate the hydrogen from the oxygen. We, I haven't given you the information you need to answer this question yet, but looking at these two tubes, I'm collecting one gas in one, the other gas in the other. Which one do you think is hydrogen, and which one do you think is oxygen? Hydrogen. Why? I like the way you're thinking, it's not correct, but that is science, <laughs> that is science though. That, that is science. I said when I'm at work and I get paid to be wrong, okay? He's thinking like a scientist and that's good. Yeah. I think that's the far step forward the other one. Right. H2, there's twice as many hydrogen as oxygen. There's twice as much gas on the left as, as there is on the right. Sand is another compound. It is silicon dioxide. We, you don't have to name things yet. That's a whole lecture coming up. But it's silicon dioxide. It's a silicon atom with two oxygen atoms. That's what that formula is telling us. One silicon, two oxygens. There is a inferred one there. We don't write one subscript. If the subscript is a one, we just don't write a subscript whatsoever. If it's anything other than one, we write it. So it's one silicon and two oxygen. So looking at that, is that an element or a compound? Element. element. How do you know? It's helium and it's right there. Since it's up here, even though we don't know what the name of it is, it's right there, so it must be an element. What about that? Compound. It's a compound. How, how do you know? It's two elements. Hydrogen's there, oxygen's there, and there's no H2O element up here. So that must be a compound. What about that? Compound. compound. We have sodium, and we have chloride, which is chlorine. That's, book, that's another thing that's coming up, the difference between chlorine and chloride. But we have sodium and chlorine, two different elements. And so this is a compound. What about that? Oh, an element. That's copper. Copper is Cu right there. So that's an element. Where things start to get fuzzy is the mixtures. Okay. A mixture is two or more elements or compounds mixed together. You can have two elements mixed together. You can have three elements mixed together, three compounds mixed together, an element and a compound, five elements and one compound, it doesn't matter, okay? It is just multiple substances mixed together. And if they're mixed together, they can be separated by a physical process. We'll learn what a physical process is in a minute, but it's, it's a process that is not a chemical reaction. If you can separate the two things out using something other than a chemical reaction, it is a mixture. If you can reach in and just separate them out, it's a mixture. If gravity will separate them for you, it's a mixture. If you have to do a chemical reaction to get things apart is not a mixture. Pencil lead is a mixture. There are multiple things in there. There's glue, there's graphite, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Salt water is a mixture. There's salt and there's water. Air is also a mixture. Where is air a mixture of? A bunch of different gases. Mostly nitrogen, but also oxygen, CO2, methane, all kinds of stuff. I said, for to be a mixture, you have to be able to separate two things using something other than a chemical reaction. 
If you want to get salt out of water, all you have to do is wait. The water will evaporate, and the salt will be left behind. That is how they get the salt that they put in your food, the salt they put on your roads if you live up north. They literally take a chunk, a beach, make a little wall around salt, salt water, and they let the sun dry it up. Then they come by and they scoop up the salt. Okay. Salt water is a mixture, and all you have to do is wait for the water to evaporate. Water evaporates at room temperature, salt does not. So the salt will be left behind. So that evaporation is one of those physical processes that I was talking about. Okay, so mixtures come in two flavors. They're homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. The homogeneous mixtures, really the best example is the solution, which we'll talk about later, are the same throughout. So you have a mixture that you can separate using a physical process, but the entire sample is the same. The top and the bottom and the left and the right, it is all the same. A heterogeneous mixture is not the same throughout. The top may be different from the bottom. There may be chunks of something in there that, not, that are at the top and not at the bottom. You need to look at it and say, is this the same throughout? If it is the same throughout, it's homogeneous. If it is not the same throughout, it's heterogeneous. Can you give me an example of a mixture that is the same throughout, so it would be a homogeneous mixture? Salt water, yes. Salt water, if, if I take a glass of water and I dissolve salt in it, it looks exactly the same at the top and the bottom, right? There's the same amount of salt at the top as there is at the bottom. It's dissolved in the water. That's a solution. We'll come back to solutions later. But it is uniform throughout. You look at it and it, everything in that glass is the same. What would be an example of a heterogeneous Sand and sand, we said the silicon dioxide, but sand by itself is a compound. Beach sand. Okay, beach sand. What, what else is in beach sand? Rocks. Picture beach, beach. There's water, there's rocks, there's yes. sand. Say sharks? Shells. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there may be sharks, but there's a lot of different things in there, right? If you take a chunk of sand, you take another chunk of sand over here, there's going to be different things in each hand. And as you take the one piece and you break it apart, you're going to find different things. That is definitely not the same on the top and the bottom, the left and the right. That is heterogeneous. If we're talking about things in water, the trick is to think about will anything settle out? If nothing is going to settle out, it is homogeneous. If something will settle out, it's heterogeneous. So if I set salt water here, the salt's not going to sail to the bottom, right? What kind of water, what can I put in water that if I set it here, it will settle up? Oil. Oil. Sugar, if it's not completely dissolved, right? If I just dump sugar in there, it's going to sink to the bottom. Sand. If, what if I take, what if I go to Lake Alice and take a scoop of water and I set it there? Is that going to be homogeneous or heterogeneous? Hetero. Hetero. There's going to be silt and stuff in that water that if I let it sit, sit there, it's going to sink to the bottom. Milk would be homogeneous, right? Milk is homogeneous. The milk, this is, this, this is really that fuzzy question that depends on how you look at it. If I put milk, you say, well, it depends on, is it the milk that I buy at Publix or the milk that comes out of the cow? Because the milk you buy at Publix will not settle up. That's homogeneous. The milk that you get out of a cow will have butter fat that's close yeah. to the top. That's heterogeneous. <laughs> so 
So we said salt water was a homogeneous mixture. And we said lake water was a heterogeneous mixture. What about tap water? Homogeneous, hopefully. <laughs> what about air? This is another, it depends, right? I mean, in a perfect world, it's in a simplified way, it is homogeneous. But if I go back there and I open a bottle of perfume, people in the back of the room are going to smell it before the people in the front of the room, right? So it's not homogeneous. And so that, this is one that kind of depends. Questions that I write, I will try to avoid the ambiguous ones. But it's possible that you may think of it a way I never thought of it. And so if you're questioning whether you were looking at it in what I was, tell me how you were looking at it. Okay? What about brass? Can you, picture, can you picture what brass looks like? Got a homogeneous. Brass is another weird one. What happens to brass when it sits out? It corrodes. The Statue of Liberty is brass. Did the Statue of Liberty start out green? No, it did not. And so, brass gets green corrosion on it. So in that case, you have uncorroded brass in the middle and green corroded brass on the outside. That is heterogeneous. But when it started, it was homogeneous. Okay. What about potting soil? That's probably clearly heterogeneous. You've got chunks of leaves, the little white lava things in there that hold the water, maybe some worms, whatever. Chocolate chip cookie dough. This is one that can lead to big arguments, and I mean arguments. Okay? Some people take this seriously, personal. Okay? When I think chocolate chip cookie dough, I think hetero. Some people say, well, it's a chocolate chip cookie dough. Dough. That doesn't include the chocolate chips. It's just the dough part. And that is kind of homogeneous. But it's not really. No. It's not really. But if you wanted to write me a paragraph explaining why chocolate chip cookie dough was homogeneous, and I agreed with your logic, I would mark it correct. For these problems, keep it simple. Okay? And if you don't know how to keep it simple, Explain to me what you're doing. If I follow your logic and your logic is correct, I will mark it correct. So this is our flow chart for classification of matter. We have a sample. Can it be physically separated? If the answer is yes, it's a mixture, it's a homogeneous or hetero. If it can't, it's a pure substance, and we go down and down and down. We can break it down into non-metal or metal or a compound. Okay. If that is helpful to you, fine. Most questions you're asked will not take ask you to define all of them. It'll be one step. It'll say, is this something that is a pure substance or a mixture? Or is it a heterogeneous mixture or a homogeneous mixture? It's not going to ask you to give me all the steps. As long as you're comfortable with each step on its own, you should be fine. Questions about these? Yeah. Is water a compound, a compound and a mixture? Water, pure water, is a compound, just H2O. But any sort of water that we have on Earth is going to be some sort of a mixture. There's going to be something dissolved in it. I mean, tap water has calcium, and fluorine, and fluoride, and all kinds of gases. I mean, the air dissolves in water. We'll learn about that also. If there's water on Earth, it has something dissolved in it. When we draw and we talk about matter in this class, we're going to do it on a number of different levels. The first is the macroscopic level. This is real world. Okay. This is what we can see, what we can touch, what we can observe. observe. So if I want, to, I want to ask you, draw gold at the macroscopic level, you would probably just draw me a gold bar, something like that. That is the macroscopic level. 
Then there's also the molecular level. This is individual atoms. This is even beyond microscopic. Because if you put gold under a microscope, all you're going to see is a very large bar of gold. We don't have microscopes that are strong enough to show us individual atoms yet. And then there's also the symbolic representation, which is just our symbols up here. So this is a molecular level representation of copper. It is just individual copper atoms lined up in neat little rows, packed together in a chunk of copper. This is helium. Helium in a balloon is made up of different helium atoms flying around. Okay? And when we show atoms flying around, we always have the universal symbol for movement, the little speed lines. Okay? You all know what they mean. Go with it. Okay? The longer the speed lines, the faster they're moving. So, in this picture, are we looking at atoms or are we looking at molecules? Molecules that are made up of what? Atoms. atoms. And so that is a molecule of, made up of two atoms. Is what is here an element, a compound, or a mixture? We've got an element. Anybody say compound? Anybody say mixture? I've got one of each. Who wants to defend what they said? It's an element. Why? Because they're both the same. They're both the same. Yes. Even though it is a molecule, the molecule is made up of two atoms of the same element. So you can have an element in a molecule form. We'll, we'll learn only a few elements do that. We'll learn which ones later on, but some elements do exist in molecules, whereas some of them exist as individual atoms. So if it was a compound, you might have a red one and a black one. That would be a compound. If it was a mixture, you might have a pair of red ones, a red one and a black one, two black ones, just different things that just got thrown together. Element, compound, or mixture? Compound. Each molecule is made up of different elements, so it's a compound, but all molecules are the same. So it's just a compound. What about that? Element. All the molecules are made up of the same element. So it's an element. What about that one? It's a mixture of two different elements, the black element and the blue one. What about that one? It's a mixture. It's a mixture of these molecules and that element. That's still a mixture. And what about that? Mixture. That's a mixture. You get two different compounds mixed together. The matter can exist in those states of matter that we talked about. These are the ones you already know. Solid, liquid, gas. If you wanted to describe the macroscopic or real life properties of solids, liquids, and gases to me, how would you describe them? I mean, if you look at what that water in that bottle is, is that a solid, liquid, or gas? How do you know? It's wet. It takes the shape of the container. What about how much is in there? If she lets that sit there, for an hour. Is the amount in there going to change? Yeah. Is the bottle going to fill up or drain? If the lid on or if off. If the lid is on, okay. it's not going to change. If she heats it up, okay. the amount in the volume of the water in there is not going to change. Okay. So liquids have a set volume, but they take the shape of their container. So take those examples of observations and apply them to a solid. Does a solid have a set volume? Yes, that tail is not going to change size. Does it have a set shape, or does it take the shape of its container? It's set shape. Set shape. So a solid has a set shape and a set volume. What about a gas? It's 
variable for both of them. You say a gas will expand to fill its container. So if you put a, a small amount of gas in a very large container, that gas is just going to blow up until it fills the container. Okay. If you then take that container and compress it, the gas inside is just going to get more compressed to go with it. It takes the size and the shape of its container. Now, if we look at solid liquid and gases at the molecular level, and we want to describe why they behave like they do at the real world level, how do you think they look? If you wanted to show me a picture of atoms in a solid, how would they be behaving? What would they look like? <coughs> They're stacked on top of each other. They're very close together. Atoms in a solid are very close together, and they are barely moving at all. They're basically just shaking in place. So because they are very close together, they're stacked neatly, they don't change shape. I'm sorry, they don't change size. They stay right next to each other. So they can't change size. But also because they just shake in place, they can't move around their neighbors. If they can't move around their neighbors, they can't change shape. Think of sand in a bucket. The grains of sand move around each other so that they fill the shape of the bucket. But if the grains of sand are glued together, it's just a block of sand. You can't put a block of sand in a round bucket. right? A liquid, the molecules are close together, but they're not as close as a solid. They're just a little bit further apart, but they stay very close together, and so the liquid volume is not going to change. But they move around each other. They're not moving fast, but they are capable of moving. And so a liquid will take the shape of his container. A gas is very different from both. In a gas, the atoms are very far apart from each other. They're as far apart as they can possibly be. Not only that, but they're flying around freely, completely independent of each other. So because they are not bound together, they're not next to each other, you can easily compress them <coughs> and expand them. Because with a gas, Almost the entire sample is empty space. You have molecules flying around, but then there's a lot of empty space between them. So because they're moving, they'll take the shape of the container. And because they're not stuck to each other, they can be compressed and expanded as they need to fill the container. So this, this is exactly what we just talked about. Uh, that's also what we talked about. And so is that. <laughs> Moving right along. Moving right along. But you know that states can change. Water that's in the liquid form doesn't have to stay in the liquid form. We easily go between liquid water to solid water to water vapor, right? We have names for those changes. We have a glass of water. We have liquid water here. If you leave that sitting out, it's going to evaporate. You have the evaporation, the liquid going into gas, and then if it's humid out and you have cold water, you get condensation on the outside of the glass. So evaporation is liquid to a gas. Condensation is a gas back to a liquid. When we write chemical formulas, we have to add on what state it is. So, a marker. If I write helium, I need to put what state it is. And you put it in a little subscript inside parentheses. If it's a solid, put an S, if it's a liquid, you put an L, if it's a gas, you put a G, and then 
we're not going to cover this today, but if it dissolves in water, dissolves specifically in water, that have its own term, it's called aqueous, which is AQ. So from here on out, pretty much every time you write a chemical formula or, or an element <coughs> symbol, you're going to be writing what state it is, solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous. So sodium chloride, that's the salt that you put on your food. It's NaCl, and at room temperature, it is a solid. And so what you have in your salt shaker at home is NaCl solid. Because if you go home, take a piece of tape, put that on your salt shaker, you will annoy your roommates. Describe to me what NaCl with an S in parentheses represents at the macroscopic level. Macroscopic. What does that look like? It looks like a grain of salt. They, they look like little tiny chunks of white salt, right? I mean, you, it's hard to just be more descriptive than that. It's, they're hard grains. They're not soft or anything like that. On a molecular scale, what does that look like? I don't know. I've never seen it. It's going to be tightly packed. Right. So we know it's a solid. And so the molecules are tightly, the, the atoms are tightly packed. They're just not, they're not moving very much. It's kind of shaking in place. And we have sodium atoms and chlorine atoms. So that's how you would describe that at the molecular level. Okay. When we describe things, we describe their properties. And there are two different types of properties. There are physical properties, and then there are chemical properties. But those properties can change. If you change a physical property, that is a physical change. If you change a chemical property, that is a chemical change. A physical property is something that we can observe about a substance or a sample without changing it. What can I tell? about this table without changing it. It's brown. Size, I can measure dimensions. I can measure how much it weighs. I can see, is it hard or soft? I can try to fold it, whatever. There are things that I can tell about this table without changing it. Those are physical properties. Color is a physical property. Smell is a physical property. Mass, volume, density, and temperature are also physical properties. But there's something different about color and odor in mass, volume, density, and temperature. This says these are qualitative and these are quantitative. What do you think that means? Yeah. Um, you know, Yes, exactly. Quantitative properties, you can put numbers to. You can say this weighs five pounds. It has a volume of five liters. I can't say it has an odor that smells like five. Okay? If you know HTML and you know hex code, you may be able to put numbers to color, but that is not this class. Okay? In this class, color does not have numbers. Any coders in here? Did anybody even get the joke? I did get okay, it. Thank you. <laughs> so a physical change is a change in a physical property. The, what it is chemically does not change. If it starts as water, if it starts as H2O, it's going to end as H2O. Okay? A change in physical state is a physical change. So boiling is a physical change. You go from H2O liquid to H2O gas. It is still H2O. That is not a chemical change. It must be a physical change. This is evaporation. Like I said, liquid water to gas water. 
the individual molecules look exactly the same. They're just further apart. And so the physical properties of it have changed. The density has changed. The color of it has changed. Things that we observe have changed. But the molecules are exactly the same. Sublimation is a state change you probably may not have dealt with too much. How many people have seen dry ice? What happens if I leave dry ice out on the bench? It smokes. It smokes. <laughs> what happens? And what happens to it? It dissolves. It disappears. It just kind of yeah. magically disappears, right? Because it's going if I if I set an ice cube on the bench, what happens to it? It melts. It melts. It goes from a solid to a liquid. CO two doesn't go from a solid to a liquid. CO two at in a room goes from solid straight to a gas. That's called sublimation. So this is a picture of CO2 solid. If I wanted to draw a picture of what it looks like after it sublimates, how would I draw the CO2 over here? Wide spacing and lots of nice speed lines, right? You gotta got show that they're flying around. So they're, they're widely spaced, and because it's computer, they're not even speed lines, they're like shadows. <laughs> People would be very impressed by that back in the 90s. So these are our different state chains. Okay? You need to know the names of all of them. Luckily, you already know most of them. Okay? Solid to liquid, melting and freezing. You know those. You don't have to go home and study them. You know them. Liquid to gas. This is vaporization, but evaporation is the same thing. I don't care which term you use. So that one you know, and you know condensation. So you've got two thirds of these already memorized. The other two, you probably have to study and make sure you remember. We said solid to a gas is sublimation. Gas directly to a solid is called deposition. We'll do this in lab. We'll take something, make it sublimate, and then go make it go back to deposition and go back to a solid. And when you see that, you'll see what I mean by this. But the way I remember this is it essentially deposits a solid on a surface. You have a gas, it's basically invisible, and all of a sudden you have a solid appearing on your side of your beaker. It looks like it's being magically deposited there. That's how I remember deposition. If that doesn't make sense to you, you think I'm wacko, come up with your own. Yeah. When you have like um, a coffee pot or something like that, and it forms that like calcium or whatever mm -hmm. it is, is that? No, that, that's just the tap water has the calcium in it. Yeah. And so because you're heating the water to make coffee, some of the water evaporates right. and the calcium is left behind. Okay. But that's all that. There is no example of deposition in real life. Okay. It's not. Don't try okay. to think of it. Okay. You will, you'll see it in lab, but you can't, in real life, you're not going to make CO2 go from gas to dry ice. It's, it's not going to happen. It has to be very, very, very clear. Okay. A chemical change is a change in chemical properties. Chemical properties are not something we deal with, deal with in real life. And so chemical changes are not things that we can easily come up with examples of. You know boiling and evaporation and, and the other ones I said, freezing, things like that. A chemical change is a chemical reaction. Those are two terms that you can use interchangeably. A chemical change is a chemical reaction. A chemical change takes some substances and makes new substances. It's essentially going to rearrange the atoms from those molecules to make new substances. If it starts with H2O and you take the oxygen out to make something else, that is not a physical change. 
as a chemical chain. <coughs> we took our water, we passed electricity through it, it separated it. We started with liquid water, we ended with hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. That is not the same thing we started with. If it's not the same thing you started with, it must be a chemical chain and that must be a chemical reaction. Pennies. You see what a, a new penny looks like, it's nice and shiny. What does an old penny look like? Tarnished. Tarnished. It's dull, right? It's kind of a brown instead of a shiny copper color. That's a chemical chain. Burning of gasoline in a car. That's a chemical chain. What comes out your tailpipe is not gasoline. It is no longer gasoline. That must be a chemical change. Not only can you separate water into hydrogen and oxygen, but you can take hydrogen and oxygen, put them together to make water. So if you took those two in test tubes that were upside down with the hydrogen and oxygen, you put them together and you gave them a spark, they would, the hydrogen would burn and you'd get water. How many people know about Hindenburg? Yeah. Hey, Hindenburg was a, a basically a, as a Zeppelin, which is basically a blimp. They didn't used to use helium. They used to use hydrogen. Hydrogen floats even better than helium. The problem is hydrogen is flammable. Imagine a giant balloon the size of this building filled with flammable gas running into a power line. That's the Hindenburg, okay? That is a chemical reaction. So this is a chemical reaction at the molecular level. This is hydrogen reacting with oxygen to make water. Oxygens and hydrogens coming together to make waters. There are three things that we look for as evidence of a chemical reaction. If you put things together and they bubble, that's evidence of a chemical reaction. The exception to that is just if you're boiling it. If you're boiling water, those bubbles are from evaporation, from boiling, not from actual chemical reaction. If you have a permanent color change, that's an example of a chemical reaction. If I put metal in this fire, what happens to the color of the metal? It turns it colors, but it gets red hot. It gets red hot. It starts glowing, right? What happens if I take it out and let it cool? Is it still orange? Mm -hmm. No. That's a temporary color change. It just, you take it out of the fire, and it goes back to what it looked like before. A permanent color change will not go back. If you have a sudden change in temperature, that's another clue that a chemical reaction happened. If you take two things, mix them together, and all of a sudden it gets hot, it's a chemical reaction. If all of a sudden it gets cold, it's a chemical reaction. If you put it on your stove, and then your water gets hot, that is not a chemical reaction. The chemical reaction is the burning of the gas in your burner. That's the chemical reaction giving off the heat. If you have an electric stove, there's no chemical reaction going on. What about when you're outside and it's really, really cold, and you you can see your breath. That is the, the water vapor from your breath condensing. So that's a state change, which would be a physical change. Okay. Yeah. Do you look like if you had your Yes, the, the, the instant, the, the, like the hand warmers? Yeah. Yeah, that's a chemical reaction. If you feel what's in there before you break it, there's like a powder in there, and then there's a packet of something. And to activate it, you squeeze the packet so it breaks. When you break that inside packet, you mix the two things together, they react, and you get heat. Sounds like a glow stick. Glow stick is the same exact thing, yes. Yeah. There's one liquid inside of a glass tube, then there's the liquid on the outside. You bend it, you break it, two liquids mix, in that case you get light. In, in the, the hand warmers you get heat, the glow stick you get light. The instant cold packs work the same way. If there's two things in there, you, when you want to mix them together, that's a reaction that it gets cold. Some reactions get hot, some reactions get cold. Some give off light. So is boiling water a chemical change or a physical change? Chemical. 
physical. Remember that. That is a great test question that people get wrong a lot. If you just change state, that is not a chemical change. It is still the same thing. Another tricky physical change is dissolving. If I dissolve salt in water, it is still salt. It's just in water. If I dissolve sugar in water, it is still sugar. It is just now in water. We went from solid to aqueous. That is a physical change. Dissolving something in water is a physical change. You'll come across that number of times this semester. So make sure you remember that. Dissolving is a physical change. Looking at these molecular level representations, when we go from the left picture to the right picture, physical change or chemical change? <coughs> I hear chemical. How many say chemical? How many say physical? Who wants to explain why they think it's chemical? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, sure. Right. Over here, we had some of the oxygen. We had CH4s, which is methane, that's natural gas. Over here, we now have water and CO2. We have the things that we started with are completely gone, and the things that we ended with, we didn't have when we started. So that is clearly a chemical change. <coughs> what about that one? Physical. It may be hard to see, but these are the same CO2 molecules packed close together. Over here, they're spread apart. So we went from solid to gas, which is called what? <coughs> Sublimation. That's a state change. State changes are physical changes. Okay. So, in, in this picture, that's a coffee filter, okay? What happened is they took a coffee filter and they folded it up into kind of a triangle shape. Can everybody picture that? So you ended up with a coffee filter that looked like that. I cannot draw, it used to. So you have a coffee filter that looks like that. They then took a black Sharpie and they colored the tip of the coffee filter black. They then took it, put <coughs> it into a glass of water, and then just the tip that was black was touching the water. If you put, put, put a coffee filter in water, what's going to happen to it? It's going to absorb it. And so the water absorbed up through the coffee filter until the entire coffee filter was wet, they then took it out, unfolded it, and that's what it looked like. Is that a chemical change or a physical change? If you think it's chemical, text that number to that number. If you think it's physical, text that number to that number. Remember, if you can't pay to do that, don't worry about it. Actually, I may have to activate it. Phone's dead. <laughs> you only let me make one active at a time. Okay, this should be active now. Chemical change or physical change? chemical, 60% physical. 45% chemical, 55% physical. So now we're about 50-50. We're just guessing. So what I want you to do is we're going to get into little groups. Let's do 
U6, U6. This is just a mess over here. <laughs> Let's go U5, and then the rest of you in the group. What I want you to do is try to convince the other people in your group that you are right. Okay? And then you don't have to come to a group consensus. After we talk in our groups, we're going to come back and you're going to vote again completely individually. If you think you're the only one in your group that's right, you can vote against the group. Okay? You're, what you're doing here is just trying to convince the other people that you are right in order to get them to vote what you think. So I will clear this. And you've got about five minutes to talk in your group. Dissolving, dissolving is a physical change. So we are dissolving. The ink is dissolving. That's why it looks. It's still here, though. The physical change. It's still here. It's still on the Everybody ready to vote then? Okay, go ahead and vote again. Vote your own conscience. But I can't, my phone is dead. <laughs> if, if you want to volunteer, you can say it out loud. But if you don't want to, you don't have to. So I don't know how that changes your... That basically makes it even. So we're still guessing. <laughs> so who wants to defend chemical change? Go ahead. Okay. We said there are three things to look for. We don't know whether it's bubble. We don't know whether it's a temperature change. But it certainly looks like a 
I mean, there's definitely a color change. It's certainly, I imagine it's permanent. So wouldn't that make it a chemical change? Yeah. It seems so. Who says physical change? Who wants to defend that? Um. So, so we have ink there, mm -hmm. and basically what that experiment is doing is moving the ink around. So it's physically moving whatever chemicals are in the ink around. However, it's still the same chemicals. Why, moving. if that's the case, now I'm not arguing, I'm just being devil, it doesn't sound bad. If that's the case, why is the whole coffee filter black? Because parts of the ink are filling up in that same what is black ink? It's a bunch of different colored inks together to make black. Okay? So, what happens here is this is called a chromatography. <coughs> different compounds, the different color inks, all dissolve differently in water, some better than others. The ones that dissolved well moved a long ways, they moved with the water as it went up the coffee filter. And so the purple moved a long ways, it dissolved well. The red in the middle barely dissolved at all, so it didn't move. And so all you really did is you separated the different color inks from each other. So that makes it seem like a physical change. So we have something that seems like definitive proof of a physical change, and we have something that seems like definitive proof of a chemical change. Which one is it? I still say physical. Couldn't you probably if you put all those things somehow back together and like condense them again, you'd probably come back up with black, so it wouldn't be a permanent color change at that point. If you could theoretically, theoretically, if you took those inks, put them back together, it would become black. Is there a way to do that? No. Yeah, you could rinse it. Um, what do you mean rinse it? You could, you could rinse it. <laughs> <laughs> you could like, okay, well, I guess you would have to rinse it and then dry it out because. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> there, there are a number of ways to do this. That is one of them. If you put this coffee filter in a whole bunch of water so that all of the ink dissolves in the water, take the coffee filter out, you now have all that ink in the water. You let the water evaporate. All of your inks back together at the bottom of the container, mixed together as black ink. That is a temporary color change, not permanent. It's a simpler way to do it, though. Add bleach. <laughs> no, that, that, that would be a chemical reaction. What if I just took this, flipped it upside down, and ran the water? back that way. It would all concentrate back at the point. Oh, it would. It would. Also, if you can come up with a theoretical way to do it that we currently don't have the technology to do, that still counts. So, how many people have seen Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? <laughs> what if you had a gun that really, really shrunk the kids? And they could take this ink molecule and move it back to the middle. And you physically move the molecules all back to the middle, that would work. If you had a microscope with tiny little tweezers, and you could do it, it would work. If you can come up with a theoretical way to do it, it is not permanent. You can move them back to the middle, get them all together without a chemical reaction. So it is not permanent, so it's a physical change. All right, we just got a few slides left to get through. <laughs> Evaporation of water, physical chemical change, physical, burning of natural gas, chemical, melting of metal, physical, that's just a state change, converting hydrogen and oxygen to water, chemical. What were the first two again? Physical. Okay, physical chemical. Okay. Chemical properties are 
hard to come up with examples of. A chemical change is a chemical reaction. A chemical property is the ability of something to undergo a chemical reaction. It's essentially how reactive something is. Hydrogen burns very easily with oxygen. That's a chemical property of hydrogen. Helium is unreactive. It's a chemical property of helium, iron rusts, and silver tarnishes. Those are chemical properties. While silver tarnishes, gold is very unreactive. That's part of the reason that gold is so much more expensive than silver. It's permanent. The last thing we have to talk about is scientific method. You all know the very basics of scientific method, but we need to make sure that we are all on the same footing, we all have the same definition going forward. Scientific method is basically a way of asking questions and then finding answers to those questions. Generally, that includes making observations. What do I see? What do I measure? Taking those observations making a hypothesis, which is a, 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 a asking a question or a guess, and then once you do enough experiments, have enough observations, you can come up with laws and theories. So an observation is experimentation and collection of data. Looking at the table and saying that's brown, that's an observation. Saying that I hear a bird, that's an observation. You don't, we don't necessarily think of that as an experiment, but it is still an observation. But you can also do an experiment and say, if I heat this table, does it stay brown? So you heat the table and see, you make a new observation. That would be your, exper your experiment. You do an experiment to collect extra data. A hypothesis is a testable explanation. It is your best guess, it is an educated guess, but it must be testable. If it is not testable, it is not a hypothesis. Where people really struggle is the difference between laws and theories. Unfortunately, these words are used in everyday life, they're used on cable news networks incorrectly. Okay? In science, they are not ambiguous. They are different things in science. A law describes the way nature works under a set set of conditions. If the conditions are the same, the same thing will always happen. Yeah. The law is repeatable, correct? Yes. A law is what always happens. It's almost a description. If I say, what's the most famous Law you can think of. Science. Gravity. The law of gravity. The law of gravity simply says if I drop this marker, it is going to fall. There's no explanation in there whatsoever. Right? All it says is no matter how many times I drop this marker, it is going to fall. That is a law. It tells you what will happen always, with no exceptions. A theory explains things. A theory can be wrong. Mm -hmm. There is nothing saying that a theory has to be correct. So the law of gravity is that if I drop the marker, it will fall. We know that. No one in their right mind is going to argue that. The theory of gravity is that two things, two objects, have this attractive force between them, and that when I drop the marker, the attractive force between the marker and the Earth pulls the marker into the Earth. The magnetic pull, right? Mm, that ma magnets are different than gravity. Okay. But magnets would be another law positive and negative magnet attract each other. Right. But then there's a big long explanation of why. That's the theory. A theory could be wrong. We think it's right, but maybe 10 years from now you'll prove it wrong. Maybe you will prove that gravity is not what we think it is. 
Right now we have our best explanation. That's the theory. The law just explains what happened, not Evolution the is a theory. Evolution is a theory, yes. <laughs> There's multiple layers to the whole evolution uh -huh. thing. And so, there's di different theories of evolution depending on what level you're looking at it. But if you're looking at it as an explanation, that is a theory. Yes. Because there's really no law of evolution. There's no law of Catholicism either, though. <laughs> so, the, basically, the scientific method is you make observations. You find the patterns or trends in it. You use those to make a hypothesis. You do experiments to get more observations. You make more hypotheses. You do it enough times. You make a theory. Then you test your theory. You do it enough times. They give you a PhD. And then five years later, somebody proves you with a theory. That's it. There's just a YouTube video that's not worth it. Are there any questions?